This week on The Anxious Truth, we're talking about how to learn to just do nothing, which seems ridiculous, but it's really helpful. So let's get into it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode number 272 of the podcast. We are recording in August of 2023. In case you are listening from the future, I am Drew Linsalata, creator of The Anxious Truth and host of this podcast. This is the podcast that covers all things anxiety, anxiety disorders and anxiety recovery. So if you have just stumbled upon this YouTube channel or this podcast, and you're struggling with things like recurring panic attacks or OCD or agoraphobia, this is the place for you. I do hope that you find what we do here helpful in some way. And of course, if you're a returning viewer or listener, welcome back. I'm glad that you're here. This week, we are talking to my friend, OCD and anxiety specialist from Cleveland, Ohio, Joanna Hardis. Joanna has written a new book called Just Do Nothing, A Paradoxical Guide to Getting Out of Your Way. And the themes in the book that Joanna has written will be very familiar to those of you who have followed this podcast or read my books or follow along with me on social media. And Joanna has taken the concept of doing nothing and learning how to do nothing in response to scary thoughts or physical sensations. And she's expanded it beyond just anxiety recovery, which is our context, to really apply it to life in general, which it does. And you'll see as we go into the interview with Joanna and talk about the book and the, and the highlights of the book and the things, the best parts that I think of the book, you'll see that in many ways, this is an interesting book because it can help you understand how your struggle with an anxiety disorder is really very related to the struggles of just everyday people who will find that they are stuck or they, you know, are overthinking or whatever it happens to be. Believe it or not, people in our community often see themselves as broken. But one of the cool things about this book that Joanna has written in her own friendly kind of humorous way is that it really illustrates that like, oh, we're not all that different than everybody else. We just might be a little bit more extreme or in a little bit of a deeper rut. So anyway, we'll bring Joanna on in a second. Just a quick reminder before I do uh, that the anxious truth is more than just this podcast episode or this YouTube channel, head on over to my website at the There is a ton of other stuff there, including books that I've written, workshops and courses that might help you along the way to recovery, a ton of free social media content. There's also 271 other free podcast episodes before this one. There's a link over to the Disordered podcast that I do with Josh Fletcher, which you can find at disordered.fm. So anyway, hit hit my website at theanxioustruth.com. Avail yourself of all the resources. I think they're helpful. People tell me that they are. So take advantage. Okay, let's get Joanna on to uh, talk about her book and talk about the idea of just doing nothing in response to scary thoughts and scary sensations and just unpleasant, distressful moments, not just in anxiety, but life in general. I think you're going to enjoy the interview. Let's get to it. Joanna, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here with you. How are you this morning? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. So as I mentioned in the intro, for those of you who do not know Joanna, Joanna is, Joanna and I connected, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago. I think, like I think it's been that long. Yeah, somewhere in that neighborhood. And uh, yeah, I'm proud to call Joanna a friend. And we've done a bunch of work together with some different workshops and things that we're doing, working on and more stuff coming. And Joanna wrote a book that I just freaking love. Thank you. <laughs> the book is called Just Do Nothing, The Paradoxical Guide to Getting Out of Your Way. And if you guys have followed this podcast for any length of time, do nothing is just one of my favorite things in the world. So let's talk about that. Why'd you write this book? Well, and you were such a you were such a part of it because we were working on stuff professionally around distress tolerance. And then uh, I had that personal experience, which is in the first chapter, yep. where uh, I got ghosted. And I it was this perfect intersection of a professional interest and then a personal uh, experience of tremendous distress. And it just kind of lit a fire in my belly about writing this book. Yeah. I didn't really have any intention. I had sort of always thought about writing a book, but that was the getting ghosted. I think it was the personal experience and getting through that. That was the impetus for doing it. Yeah. And so that was really what kicked the whole thing off. I mean, I was reading it. I, I read it. And I'm like, well, I didn't I didn't know that. I didn't know that was the thing that started you going. Yeah. 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 yeah it was so good. Which seems like it was just yesterday, which blows me away because you wrote this book pretty quickly. I know you, yeah. said you didn't, but it was fast. 
Yeah, it was fast. I had a fire. I had a fire in my belly to do it. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's talk about Just Do Nothing. And here's the cool thing about this book. So if you're listening, clearly you you might recognize Joanna. Maybe you already follow her on Instagram. Our content is very similar. We're always talking about panic disorder, agoraphobia, OCD, you know, those things. This book kind of goes beyond that. This is not necessarily just an anxiety recovery book. And it wasn't never meant to be. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, I love how you've taken the just do nothing thing, which is the thing we talk about all the time in the recovery context and just brought it to the rest of life in a lot of ways. Right. Because yeah. what I was struggling with, and this is what you and I talk about a lot under the umbrella of distress, was mm. there were just a ton of unpleasant and uncomfortable emotions that I was experiencing. You know, there was disappointment, there was shame, there was embarrassment, there was uncertainty. Of course, there was worry and anxiety. But there was also so many other feelings that went along with it, which I think is really common under this umbrella of distress. It's the same process, which is what we always talk about when we've done workshops and when we've talked about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same process. Um, but it, you know, it's different feelings. Yeah. It, so it isn't necessarily about getting through a panic attack or, you know, a wave of intrusive thoughts or, or something like that. I mean, it, it certainly is. Those skills are applicable here. But right. what happens when you take that, that sort of philosophy and that approach out of the recovery context and just stick it in the rest of life? Exactly. That's, that's not new. You know, like I always find sometimes it's amazing. People hear this sort of thing and they're like, wow, that's revolutionary. And it's, it's sort of not, because we could trace this back thousands of years, this idea. Really? I did not know that. We can. Yeah. So like this thousands? is- Thousands? There are thousands. I mean, if you can go all the way back into Taoism and Buddhism and stuff, oh, okay. you'll yeah, find right. this sort of acceptance type thing, sure. like, hey, what am I going to do with this now that it's here? Um, quite a ways. Right. You know? um, or, or not trying to control things that we cannot control, which is one of your central messages here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. So uh, distress, let's go to the distress part, because for people listening, that's probably the most uh, interesting part, right? Distress and distress intolerance and learning to tolerate distress a little bit more. And, and we've actually done a workshop on this together that we're sort of retooling and we'll, we'll bring it back. But I love when you wrote about, <laughs> this was a, a case study, I guess, or, or a sort of a, a, a paraphrasing of a professional relationship. That I'm sure you have permission. I have to put that out there because, oh, she talked about her clients. No, no, no. Joanne is a highly ethical therapist. That's not a worry. And uh, had to learn how to do distress differently. Mm, mm -hmm. that, that was one of a, a, that was a fist pump moment when I read that. She had to learn to do distress differently. Yes. What did that look like? Um, and I can't remember the exact anecdote that you're talking about because I literally say that with every single person with whom I work. <laughs> If you ever work with Joanna, she's going to tell you that. <laughs> that you have to do, you know, you have to do whatever it is differently, do dread differently, do distress differently. Um, so I say it all the time. So I don't even know. That's all right. Yeah. Well, the interesting about do, do distress differently was the old like, okay, instead of immediately trying to fix this. Oh, sure. The, the steps you check in, listen, this is why we're such a good fit. Slow down. I mean, somebody should maybe write a book about slowing down. I don't know. Maybe someone already did. I don't know. But, I think <laughs> yeah. Slow down, take a step back and respond to the situation, not the emotion is huge. Let's talk about yes. that. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. We talk about that a lot because oftentimes when we're feeling insert whatever unpleasant emotion, I think for this podcast, it's certainly going to be panic, anxiety. Sure fear, worry, doubt, it, it, we're feeling, it feels urgent. We feel our body, you know, I've, I've read it, like the, you feel an alarm system in your body. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean though, that there's actually a fire. Right. So, I mean, it's that whole concept of being able to, I think Sally Winston says, extract the urgency. Yeah. Yeah, get out of urgency and go to intentionality. Yeah, it, it's right. safe. Like act with some intention and respond to the situation, which is really hard for people listening to this to do. Absolutely. Well, then that's part of the just do nothing because our intention, you know, what's mm -hmm. intuitive to us is to do more and work so hard to get rid of that unpleasant feeling because it sucks so much. But that, you know, as we know, only makes it so much worse. 
Yeah. And yeah. so what, what actually is helpful in the long run is to learn how to ride those feelings out, let them be, which is, in, it sounds so easy, but it's so hard. Let them be, let them pass and focus on, you know, focus on what you can do in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Which is super important. And it, that's where the lessons are learned, whether it's an anxiety recovery in life, like, oh, okay, didn't have to fix this. I could actually sort of sail through it or navigate. I use the word navigate all the time. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Which works out really well. But the issue with that, I think a lot of people feel, and I'm a movie on, I'm kind of just walking, talk, walk you through your own book. Like you need that, but, uh, feel free you, to, yeah, you really made a good point too. In, in, you know, one thing a little bit at a time, you know, and you talked about that whole like new January 1st, man, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do CrossFit four days a week. I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning and journal. Everybody has grand plans to fix everything all at once. It never works that way. It never does. No, it doesn't. Who, nobody does that. No. I appreciate that everybody wants to do that, but nobody ever really does it. Well, I think this is the trap though. On Instagram, on social media, the, you know, that's what is promoted. And I think, um, I don't follow influencers, but I think that what I hear is that that's what they promote, you know, in all these extreme things. I mean, I have clients who tell me about people that they follow and it's like, oh, well, we're going vegan. We're cutting out all this, you know, gluten and dairy and we're meditating and we're doing gratitude. And it's like, come on, because yeah. no one talks about what happens <laughs> as you cut all that stuff out of your life. When you start feeling all those uncomfortable feelings. Yeah. What happens now? Exactly. Because yeah. yeah. And then that plan goes into the, the gutter and you do talk a lot about like then that harsh judgment, negative judgment. I failed. I, I blew it. I didn't right. do it. Yeah. Right. One of the things a little at a time is a great bit of advice, especially for people listening today. Okay, great. Drew says do nothing. Joanna says do nothing. She wrote this great book. I'm going to start doing nothing today. Well, that's cool, but you won't get it right, right away. And <laughs> let, let's go through those stages. I did a podcast episode and I, I think I've revisited it to the stages of recovery and you used it, the trans theoretical model of change. Sure. You know, yeah. walk people through that a little bit, because I think it's, it's so helpful to conceptualize it that way. How do you make a change? We actually go through steps to do that. Sure. Okay. So the trans theoretical model of change actually lays out stages that someone goes through before they hit action. Yep. So every, you know, this is, and this is the problem with new year's resolutions is that people just jump to action when there's actually this whole process. It's, you know, the, the stages start with pre-contemplation when you're not even thinking about a change mm -hmm. then it goes to contemplation when you're thinking about a change and you're weighing, you know, the pros and the cons of the change. And then, and you, you sort of have that ambivalence and then you go to preparation where, you know, you're preparing for the change. You're telling your support system, you're getting, you know, you're, you're getting accountability in place. So it's not that you just jump to action. You're actually thinking about it. You're preparing for it. You're getting, you're thinking about, okay, what's going to likely to get in my way? Mm -hmm. What can I, you know, what supports can I put in place before you even get to the actual action part? Yeah. I and mean, a lot of people don't get that. Right. Yeah. So they think they should just decide to do something different and boom, they just do something different. It rarely ever works that way. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, once you hit action, then it's maintenance, which is how am I going to maintain this? What do I have to do? Because I, I think a lot of people I know in anxiety recovery, too, they think, oh, well, I've done the exposures. I've done the things yep. now. Life. Do I have to maintain this? <laughs> and when they when they realize that they have to maintain doing ritual prevention or they have to keep, you know, they, they can't just go back to avoiding things. That's part of maintenance. Yeah, which makes, if you look at it that way, if you're struggling now and you're trying to get started, you're trying to move in a different direction with your anxiety or life in general, as Joanna's book is about, you know, it's okay to be working through those stages and, and they're not linear. You go back and forth between them. Right. So exactly. you might go from, you know, sort of contemplation, which is kind of that, um, whoops, that's not what we want. I put the wrong thing up on the screen. Um, 
we go, you might go from sort of like contemplation to like, okay, I, I, I'm sort of into this back to pre-contemplation. Nah, not for me. Not doing this. Too bad. Not, yeah, That's totally okay. Totally okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I get a lot of people. I mean, I think this is what happens in therapy too. People come in, they want action. Mm. But then when you actually explain what's involved in making a change, then we often bounce back down to contemplation. Yeah. So that the person can understand, okay, well, what are the active ingredients? What skills, do, you know, what skills would you need before you even jump to action? Right. What barriers do we need to think about? And then how do you prepare for that? It's actually much more um, involved than people, the people, social media, influencers, you know, I, I don't even know, like the, yeah, you. the uh, speakers we, on <laughs> Instagram that just talk about all the changes they make would lead people to believe. Yeah, that you just decide to do it. So I think if you're listening today, and you're in that point of recovery, where you just keep beating yourself over the head, why can't I get this? I don't understand. I know what I'm supposed to do. You're probably in that mode right now where you just haven't hit the point where there's a tipping point yet, right. where you go consistently into action. So you vacillate, but everybody does that. Yes, everybody in their context, it's generally like, no, I'm good. I'm fine. I have my essential oils and I tap and I'm good. And then uh, that's not working. So let me look for something else. And you stumble upon people like Joanna and I, and you start to think, uh, maybe I will do that. Maybe you get really revved up. Okay, I'm going to start preparing. And then you find out what you have to do. And you go all the way back to like, nope, I'm good back to the essential oils and the tapping. Like, I'm not doing that. Right. It's you know this is so normal. And it's okay. And, you know, you have, you know, I know from my own experience in therapy and doing, you know, exposure work, you have to be, the timing has to be right. You have to have enough energy and in time and investment to put into doing the work. Yeah. And sometimes the timing isn't right and that's okay. And I don't want people to judge themselves if this isn't the time in their life that they can do that. Yeah. There's so much good stuff in this book that targets that exact thing, feeling like a failure. If you mm -hmm. fail, I love how you put that stuff and beating yourself up and the negative judgment. Like it's easy to get into that. We all do it sometimes, but just note that you're not failing and it's okay to take a while to get there. Everybody right. does. Yeah. To make yeah. a big change. Right. Okay. And also this idea of scaling. So, which I know you and I have talked about a lot in our workshops, people come in and they want the sexy stuff. Yep. They want to be able to do the hardest stuff possible, which, you know, scaling wise is like their eights, nines, 10 out of tens. Right. But you have to start with the easier stuff to learn the process, to get, you know, to understand how to, to do, you know, to how to do, how to do the process, how to get these principles of just doing nothing with the stuff in your head yeah. and doing the behavior differently. And I think that's hard for people. It is hard because everybody, we know where the biggest restriction is in life. I, I, you know, my family wants to go on holiday or vacation and I can't go. So can you tell me how to do that? Yes. Well, if you're showering with the door open in a bathing suit because you're afraid to do it the way you used to start there, right. don't start right away with the biggest thing. Right. Yeah. And I think you might argue that like the, applying the principle of doing nothing with the scary stuff in your head do it in the least threatening context first before you go to well, what you think is threatening anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you can get some confidence that you understand it's the same process in your head, how we interact with our thoughts, how we interact with feelings we don't like and bodily sensations. It's the same process. It's just you know, some things are scaled much higher. They're much more difficult. Yeah. But if you practice the little things, you will have a some footing to stand on when you go into the more difficult situations. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You hit on a couple other things. I want to get through some points here. We don't want to go too okay. long and try to limit to okay. about 30 minutes. I'll but be quiet. No, that totally. You don't have to go <laughs> going to the good stuff. Keep talking, but that's why you're here. Um, I love the part where you talk about, there's a whole chapter called Don't Think, Just Do, which is, a very valuable advice, but at the same time, people are going to hear me say that. I'm like, she wrote what? Like, how am I supposed to not think? Thinking, of course I have to think before I do. You have to think, you have to plan, you have to what if. That's what keeps me safe. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm going to laud you for the don't think, just do. And then let's let's talk about what I know is going to be the objection to that if somebody read that. Well, and a caveat is every chapter, the first part, every chapter starts with something that annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That was pretty clever, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's usually something that either is on a word art or I've seen like on a bag or on a coffee mug. That's like a um, it's like you know, it's one of these sayings that we say that is like means well, but it's terrible advice. Yeah. And grossly oversimplified. And exactly. Watered down. Yeah, yeah. And it's one of my pet, it's one of my thousands of pet peeves. Yeah. So <laughs> that is the premise. So that was something that annoys me when, when I've seen things that say, don't think just do. Yeah. So I start out with why this doesn't work. Yeah, because you talk about the difference between a thought and thinking. Let's go down that road. But yes. why, did, why does it not work to just water it down to don't think, just do? Because water you can't, down. you know, it, it's impossible. Yes, of course, the money is in changing our behavior. Mm. I, there is no doubt. However, we also need to learn how to interact differently with our thoughts. Because you are going to think. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Somebody telling you don't think, just do is so misguided. Right. It's misguided. It's like choose a positive thought or no bad thoughts or just good thoughts. It's like we, it, it's reductive because we have to learn while we can't, we can't control what thoughts pop up, we do have to learn how to interact differently with them. Mm-hmm. And yeah, of course, the, the important thing is, is that we do actions that move us in the direction that we want to go. But we can't just ignore thoughts. Yeah, because they're going to appear. So I hear it a lot in this community where people will ask, I just can't seem to get into a, I need something, I need to get into a positive mindset for my recovery. Oh, right. Right. And that's another one. I, I, so Joanna has thousands of pet peeves. I've probably heard 112 of them so far. So I'm looking <laughs> forward to the other 900. But uh, I think that, that whole, like, I need to get, I can't seem to get it out of this negative mindset. And really what you're writing about here is, well, you can learn to treat that negative mindset in a different way. You don't just change it. Like, let me think positive thoughts or I'll just drop the negative thoughts. You can't do that. It doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, I think certainly if you're the exception that can like, great, this, you know, you probably don't need the book, Right. but for, for 99% of us, it doesn't work. That's just not how it works. And we have to be able to act our way into different behaviors. And by doing that, our mindset is likely to shift. Yeah, but only after right. you stop interacting so intently and urgently with that negative mindset. If you right. Know, or the negative right. thoughts. Right. Yeah, yeah. You can do, and we can bring back to the title of the book, you can do nothing with that negative mindset and act in opposition to it. If you, you know, there, right. that's, that's, it is a choice, not a obvious or intuitive choice, but it is a choice. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about, you know, the difference between a thought, there's, there's two things here, because I think this gets into meaty stuff. I want to go over the difference between a thought and thinking. And then the statement that you made, which is insight is highly overrated. That was a jump out of the chair and yes, moment also. So let's talk about our our skewed relationship. And by the way, this isn't just people with anxiety disorders. This is almost everybody deals with this problem where we get this over-reliance on thinking. We confuse having thoughts and thinking, and then we think that thinking is the best thing ever. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. What's the difference between thinking a thought and thinking? Well, a thought is just, you know, it's an experience. It's an, you know, it's, it's like an experience that happens in our head. Mm -hmm. We have a thought. We often don't control what thought may pop up in our head, or it may be triggered by whatever situation. Thinking is the behavior. That's the action of engaging with that thought. Yeah. So you could have the thought, you know, I think I use in the book something like, oh, this peach looks delicious. Mm -hmm. Thinking would be, 
oh, that peach looks delicious. And maybe, you know, I saw a recipe in the New York Times and, you know, I think I'm going to make that recipe tonight. But what if my kids don't like that recipe? And what if I burn the cobble? Like that's thinking. It's an active process of in paying attention and engaging with a thought. In that case, in, a, in what we might call a negative context, like now I start to build a negative narrative around the peach. I want to use the peach, but I stink at it. I'm terrible. I'm going to ruin sure. dinner. I mean, that also happens. You can also engage positively or actively in thinking in a positive sense. Like, oh, I remember when we went peach picking when I was a kid and I right. had this farm and it was great. So it goes both ways. Right. Active thinking is not just negative. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's still that active process of engaging yep. and like getting lost in some kind of like story about the peach of, of whatever it is. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Which sometimes happens automatically too. We daydream, yeah. we wander our minds. Well, that's normal. But at some point you would say, oh, wait a minute, I, I have things to do. I can't go down memory lane with peaches today. Oh, I'll, I'll come back to that later. Right. And then you move away. You do nothing with the thought of the peach. I'm going to stop working with the peach thought right now. Just right. Let it be. Yeah. Right. Now where I say insight is so overrated. I mean, I think, look, uh, there are a lot of therapies, certainly when I got divorced, having insight into processes was so helpful. Sure. But I get a lot of clients that come to me who have been in talk therapy for years right. and they're trying to understand the why that they're having a panic attack about their kids being in an auditorium in a middle seat of their kids play yeah. and the why of it and where do the roots of this and it's like they are you know they they are you know deeply troubled that they've wasted so many years and money and time and energy trying to figure out and get to the root cause another pet peeve <laughs> that people yeah. searching for the root cause of something that you know is has probably has so many things that that impact it yeah and, and i think in that situation insight can be there's that i want to dig for the root cause there's also i need to know as much as i can about everything around me so that i can predict and control and know what's going to happen and people might argue like yeah but insight is a good thing and like you said when you went through your divorce yes there was insightful moments that really helped you in the context of this particular podcast, thinking, sure, thinking is a really useful tool. It's amazing that we can do it. We need it. Like it puts us at the top of the food chain. Insight could be super helpful, but those things go off the rails. Sometimes yes. they go into a, ter a place that they're never meant to be and they become counterproductive then. Right. So yeah. digging for insight. Right. Digging for insight, especially when someone's struggling with an anxiety disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder where you're shining so much spotlight on whatever the trigger of the situation is you're just you know marking that over and over to your brain that this is important yeah and it's just reinforcing to your brain this is important so you're getting more worry about it and meanwhile no behavior is changing because as you're sitting in the therapy office and i know these therapists are well intentioned sure. um but talking about it and trying to understand the why of it, it's just like the the whole, it's like you're digging a deeper hole. Yeah. And, and some of that is, there's two things I want to touch on here. One is it's the idea that I have to somehow do something with the experience in my head. I have to do something with my thoughts and feelings and internal experiences before I can act. But But really that's not necessarily true. That's why just do nothing is kind of a you don't have to deal with that internal experience in order to change something. No. Yeah. You don't have to engineer a state of being internally and, and work with your thoughts and feelings before you do a thing. That's not, that's a mis, that's a misconception. Right. Yeah. We don't have to understand exactly. The reality is you're, you're prone to having a panic attack at your kid's play. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, that's what is. So, you know, what you want to, you know, you don't have to understand it. Like that's what is and fighting it by trying to understand it and change it and blah, blah, blah. That's where I want people to do nothing is, is trying to change it and fight it. Obviously we want to change how we react and respond to those sensations when they come up yep. and to the thoughts. 
but I don't, you know, so that's where I want people to do something differently, but I want people to do nothing with the thoughts about why is this happening? Yeah. Does this mean I don't love my kid? Does this mean I'm a terrible mother? Does this mean I'm not as good as that mother? Those are the kinds of things that I want people to do nothing with. Those kinds of thoughts. Sure. And the thing that's so awesome that I love how you expanded this concept beyond just anxiety recovery. It really becomes a matter of degree. So people who listen to this podcast in this community often will feel like, oh, I have a mental illness. I'm broken. I'm so far. I'm so different than my friends and family. But really and truly, when you read Joanna's book, you get the idea that like, I'm not that different. They often have the same problems I do. I just have them to a greater degree for now. Yeah. So they're in the same loops. They might be doing, engaging in the same maladaptive thinking behaviors and stopping behaviors and all those things. Just you're doing it maybe more than they are now. Right. But you're not all that different from the person sitting next to you in the movie theater. Believe Absolutely it. not. Yeah. Like, as I point out in the book, I mean, we're similar ages. None of us grew up knowing how to ride out uncomfortable feelings, which I think is the root of, of this is how to interact differently with distress. None of us grew up knowing how to do that. So we've all, you know, we've all have our bag of unhelpful learned behaviors to get rid of mm. distress. It's just for some, it's become a pattern. Yeah. It may get in the way of doing what you either need to do or want to do or who you want to be. Yeah. So it's interesting to see people will probably buy your book because they're just feeling generally stuck in life, but they're the same principles that somebody who's dealing with OCD or panic disorder might follow. It's amazing. I think it, it's a really encouraging thing to me. Like, Great. Not, yeah. Not, not, yeah. Not, my brain isn't broken. I'm just in a deeper rut than those guys are. Okay. That's, that's a different story, isn't it? Yeah. 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 My clients will say, you know, I want to buy the book. And I'm like, you know, what's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> we've been doing what's in the book. This is to show every, like your masters of like doing your distress differently. This is for everybody else that doesn't know how to do it yet. Yeah. Or the whole, you know, you talk about that, that theory, trans trans, trans theoretical model of change, the preparation phase often includes reading and more reading and more reading. And sometimes people in this community get stuck in that. So, sure. you know, it, people might say, well, why are you talking about another book? I mean, believe me, I could have 10 authors a week on this podcast. I'm only going to talk about a book that I think could be genuinely helpful. And yes, oh, Joanna and I are friends because I know she's genuinely helpful and I respect her professionally. So, that, you know, what does the book do? Is it going to cure you? No, of course, it's not going to cure you. But I love the message that like, hey, this sort of sounds like life. This is not just about my OCD or my panic disorder. This is sort of life, which is encouraging, I think. It's, yeah. not, it's a nice feeling. Speaking of feelings, we'll sort of wrap it up with this because I think it's super important. We could talk about this for two hours. Feelings as a fallback was another great thing that you talked about in the book. I think it's that thing where like we fall back on how we feel. How I feel must be, the, must be my indicator of what truth is, of what real is. I will use my feelings as my gauge for everything. Problematic? Uh, well, not if you're a reality TV producer. <laughs> Emotional reasoning <laughs> is the fuel of reality TV. I've never felt this way about anyone, so I'm going to marry you after two days. That is one of the greatest statements. I'm not going to hear anything better this week. Emotional reasoning is the rocket fuel of reality TV. Yeah, <laughs> I mean... Bachelorette. But for the unless, but for the rest of us, it probably doesn't work. And I don't think it works so well for reality TV because I don't know how many of those couples are still together. But yeah, yeah. yeah. But that is so common for people in this community too. They get so tied up. But it yes. feels. But I, I feel like if yes. I feel it strongly, it must be important. Yes, or it's a sign. I get the and you look. I've done it too. This is probably how I got in, get involved with that guy who ghosted me. It was I, there were signs like it's a this is a sign that I'm supposed to do this. Sure. Or the, how I feel is a sign that I'm supposed to do this or not do this. We can't, especially if you have a history of anxiety disorder, an anxiety disorder, you struggle. Yeah. We can't trust how we feel. It's just not an accurate gauge. Or the person who finds that even if they don't have an anxiety disorder, they'll call themselves an overthinker. I'm paralyzed by overthinking. Yeah, well, a lot of times it's because you rely so heavily on your emotional state to guide you that it leads you wrong sometimes. We can feel some pretty powerful stuff 
that's complete and utter nonsense. But yeah. it's so powerful, you know. Right. It's amazing. Right. Very good. I, I I think it's great. I mean, I really enjoyed the book. It's not a, it's not going to take you 10 years to read this book. It's friendly. Wow. Joanna, if you listen to Joanna today, that's how the book sounds. She's just a very friendly writer too, which is really great. Um, but yeah, it's it's really great. I, I I think it's it's worth checking out. I mean, I I enjoyed it. I appreciated being able to read it. The thing that I really didn't, it's funny because you've talked about some of this stuff in the chats that we've had, but it was interesting to see you mention Virgo signs. Here, here's the paradox <laughs> of my friend Joanna, who is here talking about all this very almost stoic, you know, Taoist, Buddhist type, very practical philosophy for doing nothing with life. And don't look at your emotions as a sign. And you literally started the book with a mention of how many Virgo signs you have in your star chart. And I'm like, come on, this is so good. <laughs> That is why right, you coexist why, in your life. And I think that's tremendous. Right. That's why the book is like so thorough because I have so many Virgos <laughs> to explain it. And so I have to be so detail oriented and perfectionistic. It was great. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is good. This is not supposed to be in the same book, but it is. And I'm here for it. So very, yes. very I have to put it someplace. <laughs> so good. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, my friend. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having time. me. Yeah. Abs anytime. Anytime. How can people find you? I'll put it up on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. Um, certainly at my website, joannahardis.com. There's a tab that says just do nothing. And um, they can go to that tab. They can fi and find information about the book. They can also, on my website, there'll be links to my social media. They can do it there. Yeah, it's all good. If and I will give you copies to give away to your audience. Oh, that would be great. So we'll figure something out to do yeah. together. So if you send me some copies, we'll do something to give Absolutely. them. Absolutely. That will be a fun activity to do together. Um, I will come back as always, as I do at the end of every podcast episode, I'll wrap it up and I'll give you guys links to get to Joanna also. If you go to the anxious truth.com slash 272, all of Joanna's links will be there. Awesome. See ya. Thanks for coming by. Oh my gosh. Thank you. It's always fun. Very good. And we are back for a wrap up. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Joanna today. I always enjoy when I get a chance to chat with her, whether it's professionally or personally. Joanna's good at what she does. She's well trained. She's experienced. She's ethical. She's friendly. She's accessible. And she's never peddling snake oil. You're never going to hear that sort of stuff on this podcast or this YouTube channel. So if you want to know more about Joanna, you want to get to her social media or check out her website or check out this book, you can go to the anxious truth com slash 272. I will have full show notes from this episode, including links to all of Joanna's stuff. If you're watching on YouTube, you can check out the links in the video description. I'll put them there for sure. And you can go check her out. Tell her I said hello if you do. Uh, buy the book. Don't buy the book. I'm sure she would say the same thing. If nothing else, hopefully this 30-minute conversation has maybe taught you something or you had found to take something out of it that is useful today and as you go forward in your recovery journey. That is it. That is episode 272 of The Anxious Truth in the books. Again, special thanks to my friend Joanna Hardest for taking the time to come and talk to us. And uh, that's it. I'm going to end the episode like I usually do. I'm going to ask you a couple of favors. If you are watching this video on YouTube, consider liking the video, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know when I upload new content. If you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or some platform that lets you rate or review podcasts, leave a five-star rating or take a moment and write a review if you enjoy it because it helps other people find the podcast. Then more people get help. And that's why I do this to begin with. Thank you for coming by. Thanks for spending time as you always do every week. I appreciate your support more than you'll ever know. And always remember that no matter how you're struggling today, if you can just turn a little bit toward recovery and just take one tiny step to show yourself that you are capable more than you think you are, doesn't matter how small that step is, it counts. They add up. That's it. See you next week. Thanks for coming by.